Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 6. I will continue talking about laying up treasures in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 34. Everyone has a Bible? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 34. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamb of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate to one and love the other. Or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and a body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cure to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the ladies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for your word of encouragement. We thank you, Lord, for waking us up and reminding us to be focused on you, God. Lord, you can get so busy into the world, but I pray that we will learn from your word today, God. I pray that your word will fall into good ground. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we talked about, and those who go to home churches, we talked about laying up your treasures in heaven. The challenge was, Jesus is challenging us, where is your bank account? Is it on earth or is it in heaven? Where is your focus in life? Is it on the things of God or is it on the things of the earth? Worldly things. And Jesus continues talking, verse 25, about the same thing. In 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or riches. It's not possible to serve both. And if you, especially 24, speaks to me because it says here, No one can serve two masters. For either you hate God and love the world, or else you will be loyal to the world and despise God. Or 
If God is number one in your life, it should read like this. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the world and love God or else he will be loyal to God and despise the world. You cannot serve God. Amen. God is challenging us. Don't try to sit on a fence. Don't try to have both things. It's not possible. You go for God or just forget about God and do your own thing. We have to make a choice. And Jesus is challenging us again and again. Who is your God? Am I your God in your life? Or is something else your God? Where are you building your account? In heaven or on earth? 25. Therefore, conclusion, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and a body more than clothing? Jesus repeats this word worry three times. 25 says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. 31. Therefore do not worry, saying. 34. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. God is emphasizing here and telling us, and it's a commandment, because in Philippians 4 it says, be anxious for nothing. It is a sin to worry. It is a sin. And God is saying here three times, he's repeating and he's emphasizing and he's saying, do not worry. Do not worry. The first time he says, do not worry about life. Whatever life is, eating, food, the daily needs, God says, it's a sin if you worry about those things because I promise you I will take care of you. In 31, he repeats it again, therefore do not worry, saying, we should not speak about our worries. Because Jesus says, do not worry, saying. And then it says in 34, do not worry about tomorrow. We should not worry about our life. We should not be worried and start speaking about our worries and concerns. We should give it to God. We should not worry about tomorrow, about when we are 60, when we are 70 years, what is going to happen. No, our trust should be in God. Worry is forbidden. Worry is a sin. Six reasons why we should not worry. So I hope it will encourage you not to worry. First of all, when you worry, what do you do? You can't sleep anymore. You think about the same thing. And maybe it's not really a big problem, but in your eyes, it's huge. It gets bigger and bigger. So, it's not good for your health, is it? You get gray hairs, white hair. Huh? You age much faster. You get much more wrinkles. It's not good for you. People get heart attacks just because they worry. That's already reason enough not to worry and to believe the Word of God. Just give it to God. It causes many sicknesses. Worry. Just think about it. The Bible is so practical. God says, don't worry, so you will live longer and have a healthier life. Do not worry. Give it to God your concerns. Verse 27, it says, Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? One cubit is about 50 centimeters. So it's about this distance, 50 centimeters. Now, if we're honest, we can't even add one millimeter or one centimeter. It's not possible. It doesn't matter how much you worry. It's not going to change anything. That's what Jesus is saying. It won't change anything if you worry. By worrying, it's just a waste of time. 
By worrying, it's not going to change anything. The only thing that will change is you because you get sick. But it doesn't change the situation. Worrying is a waste of time. Worrying has no function. It doesn't do any good. It doesn't change your situation. So Jesus says to us, stop worrying. Do not worry. Verse 30. This is the third reason. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? That's why worrying is a sin. God sees us, it as a lack of faith. Because when you worry, what are you really doing? And I will come back to that later. You are taking God from the throne and you're putting something else on that throne. You're putting your problem on that throne. And God is not on that throne anymore. That is what worry is doing. Your, your problem is becoming more important than God. So God is saying, when your problem is becoming more important and you don't put your trust in me anymore, he's saying, oh ye of little faith. Because you see yourself, you see the problem as impossible to be solved by God. God can't take care of my problem. That's why, that's why God says, Oh, you of little faith. Because what is happening when you worry, your problem is huge. And you're saying, God, you're smaller than my problem. Even though you created the world, even though you created me, but my problem is so big you can't take care of that and that's why God says worrying is a sin it's a lack of faith our trust is not in God our trust is in the world our focus has become the world instead of God because God promises us in 1027, Matthew 1027, he says, With God, all things are possible. And God says, All things are possible to him who believes. That's a promise from God. That's a promise of your Father saying to you, If you put your faith and your trust in me, nothing will be impossible. I will take care of you. I will provide your every need. So do not worry. Put your trust in me. And keep your trust in me. Because nothing is impossible for me. And it's true. We've seen God just doing impossible things in this church. I've seen him doing impossible things in my life. The thing that comes to mind is in America distance is a problem okay if you need to go get your food at the supermarket or it's not just walking distance okay uh, you're talking about it's probably 40 minutes or 45 minutes by car so it's not just you can just go and get some food so we were students me and my wife student we needed the car of course, we don't have a budget for a car. If you're a student, you don't have a budget for a car. But we needed a car. God, if you, if you want us to stay long in the, in, in the stays, we need to get food, okay? And guess what, what God did? We prayed, and somebody gave us a car. Just gave us a car. Now, I've never heard of that until it happened to me. Nothing is impossible for God. He knows your needs and He will take care of you. God is awesome. 
And he loves it when his people totally depend on him and trust him no matter what. That's why God says, do not worry. So six reasons why not to worry. The first one, it causes you to age much faster. You get wrinkles, uh, white hair. It doesn't help to worry. It doesn't change your situation. Third one, it's a sign of lack of faith. It's a sign of unbelief. Let's go to the fourth reason, verse 32. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Okay, let's go to, sorry, Luke chapter 12, verse 22. The same passage is in Luke, but I want to emphasize something here. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 22 till 34. 22, then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body which you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? We just talked about that. Nobody. If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious, worried for the rest? Consider the ladies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is the same passage. But Jesus is adding something here. He's saying, 32, do not fear. Fear. When you worry, it's a sign of fear. When you're anxious about something, it is you're allowing fear into your life. Let's go to Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven. Seven. Timothy was having the same problem. The apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. Second Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 7. It says here, Timothy had the same problem. He was fearful of people. He was fearful about what God was calling him to do in the ministry and step out in faith. So what was he starting to do? He was thinking about pulling back out of fear. Now let us see what Paul says. Verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power of love and a sound mind see fear is not from God fear is from Satan if you are fearful about something it's not from God because if God wants to warn you, he will not do it through fear. He will make it plain clearly to you that be careful. But it won't happen through fear. That's not the way God speaks. And he's saying the same to Timothy. For God does not give us a spirit of fear. Now notice, what does fear do? but of power, love, and a sound mind. When fear comes into our life, what disappears? Power, love, and a sound mind. Isn't that true? 
When fear comes in our lives, what happens? Fear takes control and God can't work. God can't work in our lives. So power disappears. What happens if we are fearful? Is it still able to love? No. Love will disappear because fear is taking the overhand. And also it says sound mind or self-control. When fear takes over, when worry takes over, what happens? You're not in control anymore. This fear is controlling you. And the fruit of the Spirit should be self-control. We should be in control of our minds. We should be in control of the things that God has in store for us. Not fear, not worries. Fear destroys your walk with God. Fear is not from God. Fear is from Satan. And it will take away power. It will take away loving one another. And it will take away sound mind or self-control. Another example of fear is in Matthew 14. I like this one. I just want to look at this passage. That how fear can paralyze us. Matthew chapter 14. This is a famous passage where Jesus walks on the water. Verse 22. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. He just had a ministry, he was just feeding 5,000 people. 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to him, walking on the sea. So what was happening here? The disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee, and a storm was hitting the boat, and they were tossed and they were probably a bit fearful. And while Jesus was praying, he's seeing, oh, they need some help. Let me go and help them. And he just got on water and he started walking to his disciples. Let's see what happened. 26. And when the disciples saw him walking in the sea, they were troubled, saying, He's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. See? Jesus immediately speaks against fear. Why does he do that? Let us see. Because it's going to be repeated again here. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Wow! This guy had faith. He came, Jesus said, yeah, you can come. So he was really walking on water. Beside Jesus, is the only human being I know has been walking on water. Peter was walking on water. Amazing! I know many people put him down, what is going to happen now, but he really walked on water. He stepped out, just imagine being in a boat, it's going like this probably. He stepped out in the water and he believed God's word. That takes faith, a lot of faith. Now let us see what destroys his faith. He is walking. Just see him walking. He's walking on the water. Just like Jesus. He's walking toward Jesus. 29. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was 
afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me! When did he start sinking? Not when he stepped out. It was when he started doubting. When he started letting fear come into his heart. That is when he started sinking. That's the power of fear. It destroys your walk with God. That's why Satan likes it when you worry. When you are fearful about something. When you are fearful about doing something for the kingdom of God. Now, just a common example. How many of you are fearful to share the gospel? Just raise your hand. How many of you are fearful, just be honest, fearful to share the gospel? Now, why is that? Do you think that it's God who's putting that fear in you? No, it's not from God. That is Satan. Why do you think Satan puts that fear in us? Because just imagine that all Christians are not afraid and they will go and step out on that water and just start sharing the gospel to every person they see. The world will be changed in, in maybe one day. But how can Satan control Christians? It is through fear. Fear can put a stronghold in your life. Fear can limit you to be used by God. Peter was walking on water, but it was fear that caused him to sink. It's the same for us. If you want, the, if you want God to use you mightily, you have to learn to step out in faith and overcome fear and not accept fear do not accept worry in your life and f put your trust in God let us be like Peter step out on the water but do not sink let us stay walking on the water let us keep our trust in God and let us follow him and do the things he's asking us to do. Let's go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 32. For after all these things the Gentile seeks. Why should we not worry? Because... God says, I take care of the lilies. I will take care of the birds. Are you not more than them? The Gentiles seek after these things. Who are Gentiles? Gentiles are unbelievers, non-Christians. They seek for these temporary things. The world seek for these temporary things. And God says, when you start worrying, it is a sign of unbelief, but it also shows you're not really walking with God. You're being a Gentile. You're being an unbeliever. And God is saying, come on. I promise you, if you put your trust in me, I will take care of you. You are more important than a bird's you are more important than the plants. Just get that image. You need to get that into your heart. God loves you so much that he gave his only son to die for you. Just imagine, if you have children, just imagine sacrificing your son for somebody else's sin. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine saying, giving up Barnabas to die for somebody else. But do you know what? God loves us so much. He says, I will sacrifice my son that he may die for you. So you can come with me to heaven. 
if you just understood how much God loves you, it would change your life. God really loves you. He really cares about you. And He wants you to know that. And He wants you to experience His love. And He says, when you put your trust in me, just like children put the trust in their parents, He says, I will take care of you. I've never, I've never seen my children worrying about, what are we going to eat? No. They just sit at the table and they wait. They expect food. This is funny toy. When a toy breaks, what does Barnabas say? Let's get some, another one at NC, Daddy. He's not worried about who's going to pay, uh, pay the broken toy. We just get one. My daddy will take care of it. That is what God is asking us to do. Let us trust like children trust their parents. That God says, when he says he will provide, he will truly provide and take care of us. And I've seen it in my life. He will take care of you. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of trusting him and giving your faith and putting your faith in God and saying God it looks like this is not going to work out but you tell me to trust you and I will trust you and for some reason it works out it will work out when we trust him that's why he says do not worry because worry is a sign of not putting your trust in him not knowing how much he loves you and how much he cares about you. Finally, the sixth reason why we should not worry is let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. This is uh, the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 5. And I want to look at the second commandment. It says here, You shall not make for yourself, verse 8, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 8, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or an idol. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I... The Lord your God am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now let us see. God says, I am a jealous God. When you make something else an idol in your life, I am a jealous God. I hate that. That is one of the worst things you can do to me, is making something else more important, putting something else, making something else an idol in your life. And do you see what he says? He says, if you make something else an idol in your life, what will the reward be? visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Sin will continue until the third and fourth generation. But, if we truly put our trust in God, what does God say? But showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments that's how much God is encouraging us to love him to trust him because he's saying when my people love him boy I will bless them a thousand times but oh boy when I see idolatry in their lives it's going to continue generation upon generation upon generation God hates idolatry. 
God hates it when something else is more important than him. He is a jealous God. That's why God says, when you worry, it's a sin. Because when you worry, you're making an idol of your problem. For example, say your problem is to pay the rent. So you're worrying, this is Monday, and you have to pay the rent at the end of the month. Uh, say on Friday, and it's Monday, and oh, I don't have the money. Where am I going to get the money from? And by Tuesday, you probably already had a restless night. Tuesday, you're still like, there's no money. God, help me. Where's the money? You cry out to God. But by the time it's Wednesday, you don't even think about God because you're angry with God. He's not helping you. He's not doing anything. So what is happening? This paying of the rent is becoming more important in your life than God. You're not worried about God anymore. You're not thinking about God. You're not on your knees praying, God help me, because your word tells me you will provide. No, your focus is how am I going to get this rent? How am I going to get money? Who, where can I borrow money? Where am I going to get this money? You would do whatever. You're so busy with getting this money for the rent. Where is God? This is what God calls idolatry. That's why he sees worry as a sin. In God's eyes, because he is a jealous God, because he wants you alone he doesn't want to share you with anyone just like I don't want to share my wife with anyone and if you're married I hope you will never share your spouse with somebody that's the same with God God says when we got to know one another when we got married to one another when you gave your life to me I got married to you and I expect that you will stay faithful to me I am not going to share you with anyone else for I am a jealous God. That's why God says do not worry because if you worry it's a sin and you're making something an idol something more important than God and that's why God says I don't like it when my people worry. So six reasons why we should not worry. Let's go to verse three, 33. It says here, this is the reward if we do not worry and how to overcome worry. 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So how can we overcome worry? We overcome worry by seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. By saying to our words, you get lost, God is number one in my life. I'm not going to worry about this. God's word tells me not to worry. I am not going to worry. God will stay number one in my life. So how can you get rid of worries? By keeping God number one in your life. And if you have problems and you feel it's coming again, that worry and Satan is trying to put lies in your mind, focus on God. Worship Him. That's the most helpful thing that I do. When I worry, I just go and praise God. Just focus on God. And as you lift up your voice to God and sing some praises and declare some praises and declare His word, the worries will be gone. The peace of God will come. And as soon as worry tries to come, try to come back, you do it again. God, I believe you, my provider, you will take care of my every need. I'm just going to praise you, God. You're an awesome God. You're my rock and my fortress. And you will see, peace will come back again. Because you're putting God number one in your life. You're not accepting any kind of idolatry. You're saying no to any other idol. You're putting God number one. That is the solution to overcome worrying. And do you know, the good thing is, if we do it God's way, we keep God number one in our life, He will reward us. 
Listen what he says. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Wow. This should change your whole life. In the world, what do we do in the world? We work hard. Our focus is on making money. And we don't care to cheat people as long as we get money. And we get richer and richer, bigger house and nicer car, whatever. But God says that's not the way to do it. God says, if you want to really enjoy life, we need to make Him one in our life. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And what does this mean? This means that for the rest of our lives, we're not going after worldly things. No, we are going to be busy with the kingdom of God. How can I do things for the kingdom of God? You ask yourself, ask God in your heart, Lord, how do you want me to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness? What do you want me to do for your kingdom and glory? And then if he tells you to do something, whatever it is, being a home church leader, uh, helping out with the prayer meeting, whatever God is asking you to do, you do it. When you make that your prior priority in life, serving God God promises us you will never have to worry he will take care of your every need and he says every need not just a few of them every need do you notice those words maybe we have to read it again he says here seek first the kingdom of God so not second how do we do it in the world? We, well, God, when we have time for you, we will seek you, okay? Oh, if I have time, I will do things for your kingdom. No, no. God says, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. All these things. God is promising us when you are truly serving God and your focus is pleasing God, are you making him number one in your life? He promises us that this is his promise that he will take care of our needs. Wow. What better, can you, what better deal can you have? The world doesn't give us that promise. But God says, who owns heaven and earth, whose streets are of golden, who gates, who gates are with pearl, doesn't seem to have a money problem. He promises us that if we keep him number one in our lives and we serve him to the fullest, as we know, as God is speaking to us, it is for different for everyone. But as we seek him and we serve him as best as we know, then God says, you do not have to worry because I'm going to take care of all your need. It's that simple. So all you have to do is make him a priority. Do the things of his kingdom. We have many people come to the church and they say, Pastor, I need help. I need to pay electricity bill. I need to pay my rent. And then I tell them, are you seeking? What are you doing for God? I'm not doing anything for God. But I expect God to take care of them. But I don't go to a prayer meeting. They don't go to a home church. They don't. See? They're turning the way around. They're telling God what to do. But God doesn't like to be told what to do. God is God. He tells us here, you better seek first the kingdom of God 
And then, I promise I will take care of you. We can't tell God you take care of me. Only when you seek first the kingdom of God. When you truly make God your priority in your life, you can say, God, look at this scripture here. I'm just reminding you, okay? Because your word tells me, state your case that you may be justified. I like to be justified, okay, God? I need some uh, help here with my finances or whatever problem you have in life. God wants to take care of you. God wants to be your daddy. But we have to do it his way and not our way. He is the one who puts down the rules. He is the one who tells us how we should do it. And we should be like children and saying, Yes, Daddy, I will do whatever I can for you, knowing that you will take care of me. And I can guarantee you, when you make this scripture, it's a good memory scripture, very important one, you can use this scripture for your life. Make it part of your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Be busy with the things of God. And God promises us, he promises you and me that he will take care of all your need. That's a promise from God. So the reward is, we will have no worries anymore. We will be living longer lives. We will have peace in our hearts. So when we make God a priority in our lives and we do not worry, God will give us all these rewards and God will take care of our every need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let's just close the message. Ask yourself, where is your account? Are you laying up treasures in heaven or are you laying treasures on earth? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God or are you secondly seeking the kingdom of God? What is your priority in life? We will just have a moment of silence and you talk with God. And if something of the message spoke to you or you need to repent, just take this time to speak to God and then I will close the message. Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for challenging us this morning and opening our eyes. And we truly pray you will forgive us, God, for putting you in a second place, for not making you number one in our lives. I pray you forgive us for being busy with different kind of things, God, instead of being busy with you, God. We truly pray that you will be number one in our lives, God. And we will do and obey you as you ask us to do, God. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we pray you forgive us for laying treasures on earth, God, instead of treasures in heaven. We pray that from now on we will change, God. And you will... Remind us of the scripture to first seek the kingdom of God and your righteousness. And then you will take care of all our needs, God. Lord, we love you for your word and we thank you for your love and your goodness. We give you praise and glory. Be blessed for supernatural strength 
to turn your eyes from foolies, worthless and evil things. Instead, may you see the beauty of the things that God has planned for you as you obey his word. I bless your ears to hear the lovely, the uplifting and encouraging, and to shut out the negative. May your feet walk on the path of the Lord. May your hands be blessed so your hands are a blessing for other people. May your heart be humble and receptive to one another and to the things of God and not to the world. May your mind be strong, disciplined, balanced and faith-filled. God give you success and prosperity in your business and places of labor as you obey his word. God give you spiritual strength to overcome the evil one and avoid temptation. God's grace be upon you to fulfill your dreams and visions. May goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your long life. God bless you with a clear direction of his will for you. I bless your house that may be a place of joy and refreshment. I bless your prayer life and that God may bless you when you read his word. May you receive understanding when you read the word of God. God bless you with peace that surpasses human wisdom. And God bless you with love for him and for your fellow men. God bless you with an obedient heart to the Spirit of God. May the angels be with you to protect you from any evil or wrong going this coming week. The Lord bless you and keep you. And everyone says, Amen. Thank you for coming this morning. And uh, the coming three weeks, I won't be here, okay? But the church will just continue as normal. Uh, we have people going to share the word and there will be enough people to help out um, so please keep on coming and after three weeks I will be coming back from, uh, from, from the States and I'm looking forward to share everything that